as he just said, uh, we actually do chemistry and biology side by side, although in two different labs, unfortunately, now at Rutgers. But nonetheless, we do both the chemistry and the biology. Uh, we are completely agnostic as to how we choose to do energy conversion, whether it's a photoelectrochemical cell that uh, we make or whether it is a biological system that is made by nature and modified uh, to become a transgenic reaction center. Um, so uh, the hope would be that uh, we can actually tell you uh, who is blowing smoke uh, when it comes to the question of uh, what's going to have a real impact uh, on, the, on the world, right? When are we playing with toys? Uh, and when are we talking about real catalytic systems that can have impact? Uh, I want to start off by um, pointing out that this is a collaboration. By the way, this is my first, actually, we haven't finished our first year. We will, I guess, in January or so. So this is a progress report. Um, and it's great to be back in the GSEP family. I was here probably about 15 years ago or so. I see Richard over there and Sally, the new director. Franklin Orr was the director at that time. I was a reviewer at that point. Uh, and uh, so I did, had no idea this was going to become an even closer relationship where um, I'm benefiting directly. So um, thank you. So uh, as Matteo mentioned, we're over at Rutgers now. We're at the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, Selman uh, Waxman in uh, Nobel Prize uh, in that area. So we have the resources of an entire laboratory and multiple collaborators to do anything we want at almost uh, 500 to 1,000 liter scale at least. Uh, and then over in chemistry with a huge uh, consortium of uh, material scientists and chemists working together uh, on materials. So it's been literally paradise. Uh, for GSEP, we partnered with a uh, former collaborator and visitor in my lab, uh, Jun Cheng at Zhejiang University, who has uh, over 110 bioreactors, each one the size of a football field. So if you want to test anything at scale, we can do it. Uh, and uh, more recently, a uh, collaboration with uh, Chris, Christoph Benning's lab at Michigan State, uh, who had agreed uh, to give us uh, some of their mutant strains. Uh, and this has morphed into a much more close relationship uh, with uh, mutagenesis going on in the two labs together. Uh, sometimes it's useful to look at pictures like this, and you can get a, a sense of what is the scale of the problem that we're trying to tackle. Uh, 300 billion um, tons of carbon dioxide uh, collectively into the atmosphere. Uh, so uh, when we start thinking about uh, microbes uh, and uh, land plants and photoelectrochemical cells, we have to factor into this, uh, are we investing our money in the solutions that are going to work? Or are we just playing with toys? I'm not going to answer that question today, uh, but uh, it has to play into GSEP decisions for sure. Uh, here's a slide I prepared in 2007 or so uh, as part of a, uh, you know, give me money uh, strategy uh, to DOE, I believe, at that time. And uh, it depicted the uh, corn crop because uh, they were anticipating uh, developing uh, corn ethanol, of course. That took off big time with the Renewable Fuels Act in 2007, uh, and uh, that mandated the cap of uh, corn grain ethanol at about 15 billion gallons per year uh, so that we wouldn't take too much for food. Uh, we quickly, within two years, capped that, and we've been pegged at 15 billion per year uh, gallons of ethanol. Uh, and it hasn't budged up. So it's clearly an artificial uh, number uh, that is dictated solely by the subsidy that's provided uh, to the ethanol producers of uh, 51 cents. The numbers you're looking at land area uh, in 2011, about 25% of the land that was used for corn ethanol, uh, uh, but really a total of 84 million uh, acres for all of our needs for, for corn, be it uh, you know, locally for food, for uh, animals, and for overseas, and so forth. Whoops. Um, <clears throat> so that turns out to be 4.4% uh, of the US land area right there in 2011. Uh, so that generates our 15 uh, uh, billion gallons uh, of ethanol. Oddly enough, uh, they actually have to take some of the uh, non-dedicated uh, corn ethanol or corn grain from uh, other applications to, uh, to make up this 15 billion. So it's about 41% of all corn grain goes into corn ethanol. It's absolutely huge number, okay? 
Um, and where are we going? 2026, uh, it would be predicted, uh, these are conservative estimates uh, by the people who are uh, most likely to give you the lowest numbers, about 11 to 90% land area mass for cellulosic ethanol. That's to provide only about 15% of the transportation fuel and light vehicles, right? Because only 15% ethanol is, is cap, right? Can you imagine that this planet, if we use agriculture uh, for all of our uh, bioproduct needs and fuel needs, it would be unlivable, literally unlivable. Um, so this notion of uh, using agriculture based upon photosynthesis to pro provide co commodity chemicals and biofuels is an absurd concept, okay? And it's absurd because we have uh, a photosynthetic uh, efficiency which is uh, capped at about 1%, best case in greenhouses and so forth. It's typically well below that. So uh, photosynthesis is abysmally inefficient. If I went to just up the street, up to uh, uh, your investors, where, where the sun, uh, Silicon Valley, right? I said, I got a great process for whatever, formate or uh, uh, some hydrocarbon, um, but my uh, plant that makes it is uh, less than 1% efficiency. You know, they would laugh and sort of go somewhere else with their money. Uh, so that's the task, is making photosynthesis efficient. And so here's one of the uh, partial ways out, is to build a uh, algal bioreactor. Algal photosynthesis is more efficient than uh, land-based photosynthesis. Uh, you would provide nutrients, uh, seawater, hopefully, at uh, low cost, CO2 from fossil fuel plants. Uh, you need to get, uh, typically, organisms that can tolerate 15% CO2 in the, in the flue gas, and that's a challenge right there. Is this going forward? All right. Typical yields, 20 to 40 grams per meter, per square meter per day, uh, what you're looking at. So in an optically thin bioreactor, so it says if you want to have an impact on that 300 billion tons, you need to cover the earth multiple times over uh, to achieve that. Uh, so there are some advantages uh, to the algal system, and certainly we work on this uh, largely to understand uh, the process of light energy conversion so that we can use those tricks to make better man-made photoelectrochemical systems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're going to be making oil this way. The organisms that are doing this uh, are uh, algae of one type or another. Uh, Nanochloropsis was chosen for our GSEP project because of a significant toolbox for uh, modification of this organism. We know that wild strains won't do it. Uh, we certainly still look for wild strains that are um, metabolic outliers. Uh, we're looking for the Usain Bolt of algae, literally, uh, or the hummingbirds amongst the class of uh, birds, of course, we're looking for the metabolic outliers. Uh, and we have certainly have found some that are far better than nanochloropsis, but no genetic tools uh, for them uh, at this stage. So what we learned in nanochloropsis might be transferable to something that is a Usain Bolt, let's say, of algae, we hope. Um, Lipid yields in nano uh, are around a quarter of the biomass yield. You can get it up to about almost 50% by nitrogen deprivation uh, from the growth medium. Uh, another aspect here of its benefit here is indicated in the theoretical lipid yield uh, here. These are numbers from scientists uh, who are completely disconnected with uh, algal culturing and, and mass scale. So these numbers are uh, Pollyanna-based pie-in-the-sky uh, estimates based upon you know, a one-liter bioreactor. Uh, 10,000 uh, grams per, what's the number here? I can't even read it myself. Does he have it? Yeah, there we are. 10,000 10, uh, kilograms uh, per hectare uh, per year. Okay, so knock that down by a factor of 10 uh, for the normalization and then probably another factor of 10 for the uh, challenge of growing outside. Uh, so the numbers are... Uh, are out there from estimates. Nitrogen deprivation, after you grow up the, uh, the cells, removal of nitrogen from the medium gives rise to lipid accumulation in many cells. You can visi visibly see these. Anyone who's read uh, most of the uh, algal literature, you see pictures like this by the, you know, every, every other article. <clears throat> but you rarely see uh, the predictions of what it does or at large scale or actual experiments at large scale. So that's the big challenge. So why nano? Uh, nano has a very high uh, diacylglyceride acyltransferase uh, set of genes. If you look at the number of gene copies, 
uh, amongst the heterocons, which include, these are the diatoms, uh, of which uh, nanochloropsis is a member, but it doesn't have a silicate frustal. It has the largest number of uh, uh, DGAD genes uh, of any phototrope known. And that's apparently because of evolution. It evolved late in, in the photosynthetic uh, life from uh, the, comp the com combination of a heterotrope with green and red algal chloroplast, uh, or algae to make chloroplast. Uh, and so it has all of those in its genome. So uh, very versatile, at least, on the end stage of lipid biosynthesis. So that was another reason for choosing it. So high uh, lipid productivity, uh, complete uh, sequence uh, genome uh, for uh, a couple of the strains uh, here from the lab. The Benning lab did one of those genome sequences, uh, and so we've been collaborating with them on modification of this uh, alga. There's also um, targeted mutagenesis based upon transformation uh, of this described by two different groups. Uh, first, uh, a group uh, here, um, Chris Niogi's group, on a homologous transformation, and then more recently, a CRISPR-Cas9 um, observation that you can transform this. So it looks as though you'll be able to make any uh, mutation that you want. Uh, a big problem with algae, and particularly with um, Nano is that uh, it has a carbon concentrating mechanism, uh, which means that uh, it concentrates CO2 in the cell. <laughs> and and uh, looking at the genome, you can see that it has two carbonic anhydrase uh, uh, genes uh, indicative of uh, uh, classical carbonic anhydrases. It has two bicarbonate transporter genes, so it looks as though it's well set up to bring in CO2 and bicarbonate and concentrate it in, in, the, in the cell. Uh, so th there's consequences for this if you're growing algae at 15% CO2, uh, which is shown here. Uh, the biomass concentration in grams per liter here uh, in air, if you supplement up to 2%, many phototropes, land plants grow better, of course, algae do too. You go up to 5, 15 percent, uh, you knock it way down, way down. So uh, you have to figure out a way of either uh, eliminating the uh, expression of this set of uh, genes in here or, or other ways in which you can make it more tolerant uh, to the uh, CO2 and bicarbonate that's uh, going in the cell. Um, so here's the overall strategy. We're going to start with Nanochloropsis oceanica. This is an open uh, strain which uh, has no um, patent uh, liens on it, so anything that we make uh, will be free to the public. Um, <clears throat> we're working with uh, Michigan State. First, they gave us uh, 400 of their random mutants that they created, and we were going to screen for high CO2. Uh, we've had to throw those uh, mutants away and made 1,000 more because the techniques for making them improved in the interim. So uh, we went back to them and worked on improving that and both they and, and also now using the better method for random mutagenesis. Uh, and then targeted mutagenesis for high lipid producing strains. We searched the literature for what are the kinetic roadblocks or, or limitations in the biosynthesis of uh, triacylglycerides. So, and that would presumably get us winner strains, uh, both random and targeted, hopefully. Uh, and then we would unleash the arsenal of modern molecular biology and chemistry and characterization of biochemical, uh, the metabolite profiling, the physiological characterization, and the mutant um, uh, localization as well. Uh, that would then bring us uh, some winter strains, a very small number, over to Zhejiang University with our partner Jun Cheng, uh, where they would begin the scale up. Uh, from uh, small bioreactors to greenhouses, then all, all the way up to these football field uh, trials. Uh, so we're not at Zhejiang yet, but um, that's in the future. Forward random mutagenesis. Uh, so here's the strategy that we're using is to um, in introduce a plasmid uh, into uh, the nanochloropsis uh, electrophoretically and do that uh, randomly and then screen for phenotype. Uh, the screening that we're doing is on a fluorescence-activated cell sorting instrument that can distinguish between uh, lipids, high lipid yield using a stain or high chlorophyll uh, by fluorescence. <clears throat> and you pull those uh, winners uh, out that way, you grow them up, and identify which ones you want to um, propagate further. 
Uh, and then, so they're grown on uh, antibiotic resistant colonies. Uh, this plasmid would have a marker for an antibiotic resistance because that hit there. Uh, you can then also screen for high CO2 tolerance in a, in a uh, reactor where you get up to 15% without killing your students, hopefully. And that's non-trivial, actually. It turns out uh, the health and safety people are very, very conscientious about this, which is good. Uh, so further characterization, once they pass through those three screens, uh, would tell us what are the, the winners. Uh, here's an example of metabolic engineering for targeted mutagenesis. Uh, so I presume you all remember undergraduate work where you studied photosynthesis, which has light reactions that produces both NAD, uh, NADPH, a reductant, and, and ATP. Those are used in the Calvin cycle to fix carbon dioxide, which makes uh, uh, C3 and C2 uh, intermediates from that. Uh, and uh, the C2 intermediates, acetyl coenzyme A, feeds directly into, um, excuse me, what does the yellow light mean? Should I pay attention to that yellow light? Okay, it's changing light colors over here. Okay, yeah, I didn't think there was a problem. <laughs> um, so we would uh, be going into the uh, um, glycolytic pathway of those uh, products that go uh, into acetyl coenzyme A. That's the entry point into the tricarboxylic acid cycle, which goes on to bake both energy, uh, but also proteins, right? Or precursors to protein. So um, we know that nitrogen deprivation, elimination of protein biosynthesis elevates lipid production. So we know that we're stopping the TCA cycle by nitrogen deprivation. So the strategy we chose was to knock out citrate synthase uh, here. And that was targeted in a non-photosynthetic organism and shown to produce higher lipid content. In fact, that along with lipases knockout in a still yet n uh, another organism uh, was shown to increase tag pr production, triacylglycerides, and both the uh, diacylglyceride and phosphate phosphatidic uh, acyl transferase enzymes involved in lipid um, pr production from fatty acids uh, were shown in independent organisms uh, uh, to actually increase um, lipid production. And then in a non-photosynthetic organism, the glycerol pathway to make glycerol, remember the backbone of lipids is glycerol, uh, overexpression of that in a non-phototrope was shown to increase that. So we targeted these five, three for upregulation, two for, for knockout, uh, and uh, uh, GSEP liked that idea. They funded us, uh, and very, very quickly we learned that uh, our person who was giving us the random mutants was already doing PDAT and, and DGAT. So rather than copy that, we, we said, well, let's do the other ones, and then we can stack those mutants together uh, in, in a single organism and see if we can really kick, uh, kick the lipid production up. So that's what has happened with, with Michigan State doing PDAT and DGAT. We're doing G3PDH, glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase, lipase, and, and citrate synthase. Uh, I'll just show you one of the results here, which is uh, the um, overexpression of the glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase, which uh, is this gene here. So in a plasmid, it has a bidirectional promoter uh, with that that can both express, overexpress the uh, G3PDH as well as bleomycin. And uh, bleomycin confers resistance to an antibiotic, zeosin, so you can screen by that route. Uh, and if you want, you can also see it light up because you put in a luciferase uh, gene as well. You can see the colonies lighting up because it has incorporated the uh, luciferase gene. You can do the PCR on the plasmid and demonstrate here's six different insertional mutants uh, in which the one kilobase uh, gene fragment for this uh, plasmid was inserted, so we, we know it's in there both by two different markers. So the hope would be then that uh, we'll move on to physiological characterization. Is it a winner? Uh, does it do anything? Uh, which of these mutants, because you know, it's random insertion, are, are the better uh, overexpressors and don't knock out other functions? So that's the strategy where we stand on that. Uh, here's uh, some growth attributes of nanochloropsis uh, here in the laboratory, Oops. Uh, whether it's on shakers or with bubbling. Um, one of the first, and we're typically growing uh, at 22 and low light intensity, 35 micro Einstein, 22 degrees and 35 micro Einstein. Uh, so that's a low light flux. Um, 
And you can ask the question, well, uh, what's the temperature dependence of that? That's in progress uh, at that large scale, uh, but also at, um, uh, in our physiological studies, which I'll get to shortly. So here's one of the first things you find is that you better aerate this. Uh, it doesn't like to be shaken. It likes to be aerated. So um, uh, literally, that's an important uh, feature here. So one is going to have to do a lot of mixing if one uses this in open cultures. If you add glucose, uh, and this is the doubling time in days, so they're all in this um, 20 to uh, uh, 10 to 20 uh, hour uh, doubling. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that should be hours, 20 hours doubling time uh, and days of growth. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but if you add a chemical reductant like glucose, a native chemical reductant, uh, you can see that uh, the doubling time gets quite a bit longer. So what this tells us is that if cells lice uh, and it spills out glucose and any other reduced carbohydrate, it is going to suppress the growth of the remaining part of the culture. So you better take good care of your culture because any reduced carbon around uh, ends up reducing the plastoquinone pool for the experts and means it shuts, turns off photosystem two. Uh, so some practical things are learned by that. Here's the um, first selection of the random mutants. A again, these are um, selected based upon growth. Uh, will they tolerate hygromycin? Uh, here's the wild type strain. It's dead on three levels of hygromycin. Here's uh, a mutant strain. You can see it's growing. Uh, so we would take, in principle, our up to 10,000 random selected mutants. We're only at the 96 well level right now. We've got 1,000 mutants, and we took our first plate uh, and found some winners. We selected them out based upon chlorophyll content. We then grew them up at larger scale, as depicted here. You can see wild type on the end, and you can see uh, there are some differences here in growth rate as far as chlorophyll. Is a, this B1 uh, happens to be quite a bit higher. If you look at the doubling time here, uh, and here we got it right, it's in hours, you know, between 20 and 40, uh, so some are slower than others uh, relative to wild type, but here's one that's growing better, that is this uh, G2 uh, organism, a faster doubling time. Um, if you now look at those same mutants, uh, again, you can measure the moles of oxygen per cell, per flash, right? So this is a classic experiment of Bessel Koch and, and Pierre Joliot from 50 plus years ago where you use a single turnover xenon flash and you measure the yield of oxygen and it oscillates uh, with period four, which is the signature of the manganese cluster that splits the water. Um, so, uh, and clearly uh, just taking equal aliquots of these, you see quite a difference in the yield of oxygen here. Uh, if you divide the oxygen yield by what is called FV, which is the chlorophyll fluorescence quantum yield for photosystem two, you're saying, this is how many oxygens can I make for every charge separation event that photosystem two does? So here's wild type, and you can see we have two winners, one of which is this B1, which is growing great. You can see the chlorophyll is uh, also a positive indicator that this is great. And this is saying it's because probably it's making a whole lot more energy conversion uh, in this phototrope, as is another one down here as well. So this would be one of the more advanced levels of characterization. Uh, so we're on our way. Uh, the next step, uh, at least that, uh, yeah, when we get the real winners, uh, you know, the final winners, will be to take these to uh, Zhejiang uh, University where they will grow them up in, uh, in their laboratory first at increasing scales, demonstrate that they can validate our results, move it over into a greenhouse at somewhat larger scale, and then ultimately uh, out to the open ponds uh, where they have about 100,000 square meters of surface area where they could explore if necessary. So that's where we stand. We have 1,000 mutants created by electrophoretic random insertion into uh, their linear DNA constructs designed for screening of antibiotic uh, selection and site localization. We have a citrate synthase knockdown targeted mutant already. We're trying to redirect carbon into lipid biosynthesis uh, under that test. I mentioned the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase over overexpression strain. We'll be uh, looking at that shortly. Uh, we have a uh, stacked mutant uh, with uh, the citrate synthase and the uh, G3-DPH overexpression in a single strain that we'll be testing shortly, we hope. Uh, energy conversion yields and kinetic choke points during PS2 turnover uh, have been determined. Uh, so we've done a complete physiological characterization of 
uh, two strains, uh, Gadatana and Oceanica thus far. Um, and soon we'll be going over to China, we hope, with some winners. Future directions uh, would be to build further random mutant libraries. We want to get up to 10,000 and look, looking for higher lipids, higher growth rates, and tolerance to CO2. Um, <clears throat> we're going to then certainly identify the winners as far as where they are, which genes they're targeting, uh, and so uh, have a knowledge base growing. And then uh, selected random and targeted mutants so with high lipid and, and high growth traits. Uh, would be further characterized as to what is their photosynthetic capability? Are they really over uh, doing photosynthesis, which is what we, we think is limiting things overall, the light re uh, reactions. So with that, I am going to uh, thank the people who did all the work. Uh, as I mentioned, we're in the Waxman Institute of Microbiology, but also in the chemistry department. And... Um, at Waxman, uh, Gennady Ananyev is, is chief of the uh, physiological characterization, energy conversion. And then we have two graduate students, Yuan uh, Zhang and Hua Wu, who are doing targeted mutagenesis and growth uh, physiological characterization. And Yunbing Ma is uh, doing the random mutagenesis uh, work. We have a couple of great undergraduates here in red working with them. Um, and I don't want to forget our collaborators, Jun Cheng at Zhejiang University will be we're going to be putting him to big work very soon, we hope. And certainly Christoph Benning for his uh, very uh, generous offer to uh, provide both mutants, but also then uh, co-training and, uh, and uh, stack mutants. Uh, we'll work together with him and his student, Eric Polinar. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, for the great presentation. Questions from the audience? Um, as far as getting them out into the open ponds, is there any thought that's going into keeping them competitive with regular algae strains that would get introduced once it's uh, in an open environment? Um, no, we're thinking very monoculture as scientists uh, are. So I think you're asking, would it be beneficial to have a polyculture uh, that might be more stable, robust, and so forth? Um, uh, I can show you samples from Yellowstone National Park that were gathered uh, in 2009. The only thing we've added to them uh, is uh, deionized water, and they're as green and lush as possible. They have everything they need in there. They have the nitrogen fixers, uh, you know, they have the sulfate reducers, uh, they're happy. So you're right, we've got to go that way, um, but I think we have to do the hard science first. One more question, please. Is there a microphone? Oh. Uh, right. I, I think the question might have been a little different. Uh, at least my question is, how do you keep the wild types from poisoning the systems? Um, uh, certainly a good question. Um, the title of the talk really uh, is different than what I presented. It's all about uh, metabolic uh, scaling and so forth. And indeed, uh, what you typically find is that the wild types are, are not necessarily the fastest growers, but they're more robust and tolerant to stress. Uh, and so um, that will be the big challenge. Can we break uh, the well-known uh, scaling relation that says if you, you make more energy, you make more uh, osmotic pressure inside the cell, you make it more susceptible to lysis, um, will we be able to solve that? I don't know. Good question. Okay, very last one. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor, for your great presentation. I'm from China, so I'm interested to know because you're cooperating with Jason University. So when you cooperate with them, do you need to collaborate or report to any government departments? And the second question is, how do you solve the intellectual property rights ownership um, issue? Um, fortunately, uh, I don't have to deal with the Chinese government. Uh, Jun Cheng does. And I'm sure there is significant uh, you know, work in reporting that. I was there in May, uh, and we went up to the Yantai uh, bioreactor facility in, in Shandong province. The engineers were very gracious and eager to show us all the facilities. They are eager to collaborate and so forth. Uh, the reason for choosing um, Oceanica as the strain is that there's no patent lien on that. So any of the uh, development that we do, we're openly sharing uh, with Zhejiang uh, University. 
I have no interest whatsoever in getting patent rights for Rutgers, okay? Uh, it's all about solving this big problem. And uh, they were willing to donate at no cost, it doesn't cost GSEP anything, to use these bioreactors. Uh, and you can imagine the significant investment uh, that that takes. So um, uh, I don't really have good answers uh, to your question other than in my particular case, I'm not allowing that to be a roadblock uh, in our collaboration. Great. Let's thank Charles one more time.